Hello everyone, today we will be giving a presentation for our class in Energy and Mineral Engineering 521. My name is Michael Kearns and my group mates Ann and Shakshi will be giving you a presentation on distinct lattice spring methods. Starting out with the introduction, lattice spring method is a numerical model used for simulating the mechanical behavior of materials under stress, with a particular focus on deformation. These models can simulate the behavior of materials under various conditions. And with the model, the material is discretized into nodes or particles connected by springs or bonds, and this is what simulates the physical behaviors of these particles. Now, the distinct lattice spring method allows for natural integration of fracture and failure mechanisms without the need for additional special elements or complex remeshing strategies, which is often a characteristic of traditional finite element methods. Now we have the method comparison. First, I'm gonna tell you about the distinct lattice spring method, and then I'll go into the other methods learned in class. So for DLSM, it is meshless and uses a network of discrete points which simplifies setup and modifications. For discontinuities, it naturally accommodates these through the cracks in its model structure. For the efficiency, it is highly efficient for specific problems involving fractures and dynamic issues. And with regard to materials, it is excellent for brittle materials and conditions involving sudden failure. So now the other methods that I wanna highlight on are the FEM or finite element method, discrete element method, DEM, and boundary element method, BEM. So for the mesh of FEM, this requires meshing of the entire domain, which is complex for intricate geometries. For the DEM, this requires discretizing the blocks or particles and is suitable for large scale interactions. For BEM, only surface meshing is required, but this has its limited applicability, whereas the DLSM, this is one of its main advantages. For discontinuities, FEM requires remeshing for dynamic problems. DEM, it handles discontinuities as it models separate interacting entities. With BEM, it is not ideal for discontinuities unless combined with other methods. Moving on to efficiency, FEM is also versatile, but it can be you know, comp computationally demanding depending on how refined the mesh quality is. And for DEM, th the same principle would apply, but only to the particle count increasing. For BEM, it is efficient for specific problems, but it is limited in scope due to boundary only modeling. Lastly, we have the materials. FEM is versatile and it's applicable to almost all material types, but it does require complex material models for refined accuracy. And with DEM, it is ideal for granular or blocky materials where individual particle interactions dominate. And BEM is best suited for elastic materials in large domains like, like geotechnical applications. Now moving on to what are the special features of our DLSM model? As I stated before, it is meshless, and this significantly reduces the complexities involved in pre-processing stages typical of mesh-based models. For the microstructure, it incorporates the actual microstructural characteristics of the material being modeled. This allows for a detailed representation of internal interactions and responses. This also provides enhanced accuracy in predicting material behavior under various loading conditions especially those of heterogeneous materials. For macroscopic parameters, unlike our other methods covered that require extensive calibration of microscopic parameters, DLSM directly utilizes those macroscopic materials properties such as Young's modulus, Poisson's ratio, and fracture toughness. This streamlines the simulation process, reduces the time and expertise needed to prepare and run simulations. Now there are some shortcomings to our DLSM model. One of these is that it's computationally intensive, and this is due to simulating large-scale domains or systems with a high density of lattice. When you're applying the macroscopic parameters to the model, it also may not reflect the real behavior of these materials, and it, since it is only a simulation. For complex boundary conditions, the DLSM is more, uh, more intensive, and it may be easier to use than other methods learned in class, such as the finite element method. There's also limited empirical validation of this model since there's such a wide range of materi materials and conditions that could exist. And there also is a huge activation energy in trying to learn how to simulate this model and apply it, uh, especially if you're not familiar with lattice-based or meshless methods. 
Now I'm going to touch on the historical perspective. So the DLSM model originates from the LSM, and this was originally proposed to solve elasticity problems with fixed Poisson's ratio limitations. However, it was particularly limited in handling complex discontinuities and dynamic material responses. And that part of this was due to uh, the lack of efficient computational um, technology, and therefore the finite element method dominated at the time. The DLSM was originally based off of the lattice spring model developed by Alexander Heinrichoff in 1941, and he developed this to address elasticity problems with the bottom-up one-dimensional modeling approach. His analogy modeled membrane and plate bending of structures as a lattice framework, and as I touched on before, uh, at the time being, his model received little attention due to the lack of computational power at the time, and this led to the development of the FEM model more so. Now looking at motivation, as time progressed, so did the computational power, and material science demanded more precise simulations. There was a clear need to evolve LSM's capabilities and address dynamic fracturing, wave propagation in rocks, and stress responses in materials with complex microstructures. This is what led to the, um, the evolution of LSM, and now we have the modern day distinct lattice spring method. Now going from Heinrichoff's proposed LSM model to our modern day DLSM model, the motivator was to incorporate more detailed and variable material behavior. And this was accomplished by the increasing technology and computational power uh, as time progressed. So from the LSM to the DLSM, one of the main differences is that there was a transition from particle displacement to local strain calculations for spring deformations. And this enhanced the model accuracy. Um, for implementation of both regular and irregular lattice configurations. This allowed us to better simulate the heterogene heterogeneous properties of natural materials. And in the figure here, we have the deformed spring. You can see the theta and how it fluctuates as deformation occurs. Now I'm going to highlight the general principles behind uh, the lattice spring methodology. The general principles behind the lattice spring methodology is that materials are represented as a network of points, or lattice points, and these are interconnected by springs. And the springs are utilized to simulate how these materials behave under various forces. So there are two different types of springs. We have normal springs. These resist compression, help lattice points maintain their distance under compressive forces, but they do fail under excessive extension. And the other type of spring is shear springs. These allow lateral and sideways movement of lattice points, and they allow us to understand the resistance of the material to shear forces applied. The distinct lattice spring model, which is just an evolution of the LSM, uses explicit three-dimensional configurations for dynamic scenarios and implicit two-dimensional setups for those cases that are static. And as I said before, we have our normal spring and our shear spring. Each bond only has one of each spring, and there are two types of bonds. Type one consists of three particle spring bond located at structural boundaries. Type two comprises a four particle spring bond and is found in the material's interior. On the bottom right here, we have an image um, of the different springs. We have our normal spring and shear spring, and also the bond types are visible. Now looking at the general principles behind deformation. So it is assessed based on local strains in the particular cluster using this equation shown. C is the interpolation matrix, and U is the displacement vector of particles, where U to the power of N is normal and U to the power of S is shear. And this deformation can be calculated using the shape function of a linear triangular FEM element, or by employing a moving least square MLS method over these particles. I will now pass it on to my groupmate to review the governing equations. Spring bond deformation takes into consideration three parts, which is the rigid body rotation, rigid translation, and deformation. The rigid body rotation includes this rotation matrix as shown here. The rigid translation is given by this equation, which includes the displacement in x and y direction. Finally, the actual deformation is given by this equation, which includes the strain terms. Combining all the above three equations, which were shown in the previous slide, we get this first equation, and to determine the spring bond deformation, we need to find how the distance between A and B changes 
after deformation. And we do so by subtracting the initial position vectors. And after doing that, we get this second equation displayed here. Now the relative displacement or the springboard deformation between two particles A and B in the cube can be calculated as um, shown in the first um, equation. Since the rigid rotation cannot cause strain energy in the cube, the springboard deformation between two particles, which can produce the internal force needed for strain energy, follo follows the given equation. This equation is uh, the formulation for um, a springboard deformation under, under a general deformation. Since spring bonds can have a very large deformation, the normal direction of the spring could be totally different from the initial direction. So, unlike in the small deformation case, large deformation analysis should use the normal direction of the deformed spring bond. The normal direction of the deformed spring bond is given by the um, first equation. Using this, the normal deformation of the spring bond is calculated and is given by the second equation. The shear deformation is given by the last equation shown here and the general deformation of the bond using all the above equations which is from point A to point B is given by this equation. The interpolation matrix cannot be determined by the initial position of the particle of the particle cluster but rather it requires the displacement of the particle. The deformation as a function of the displacement vector of the rectangle is given by this final equation which contains the term Cu, which is the interpolation matrix that accounts for the geometric nonlinearity. To calculate the Cauchy strain, let's look at the large deformation the theory. Cauchy strain is given by F is equal to I plus Z, which is equal to I plus grad U, where Z is the displacement gradient tensor and F is the deformation gradient tensor. F can also be written in this matrix form displayed over here. And um, Q, which is the rigid rotation matrix over F, can be written as the equation displayed here. U, which is a symmetric matrix, can be obtained from all these equations and is equivalent to this matrix. And finally, after all the calculations, the Cauchy strain is calculated, can be calculated using this final equation displayed. In DLSM theory, each spring bond is made up of one normal spring and one shear spring. The spring stiffness matrix, it's written as um, equation 1 in the form of this matrix, where Km stands for the normal stiffness and Ks stands for the shear stiffness. We use the energy equivalence principle here and also different spring parameters and, and the elastic constants such as Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio, we can find the equation for plane stress problems and plane strain problems. And these bo both equations contain Young's modulus, Poisson's ratio, and uh, lattice coefficient. Lattice coefficient, if you see the formula, the L here stands for the original length of the ith bond, the NB is the number of the spring bonds, and A is the total area of the lattice model. We know that there are two types of springs, normal spring and a shear spring. A normal spring is resistant to compression and it is destructible at um, an extension above uh, a certain level. But um, in case of a shear spring, it's destructive above a certain level in all the directions. Using the energy minimization principle, we can find the strain energy stored in the spring bond and is given by uh, equation 1 and if you look at this equation carefully we can see that it is quite similar to the fundamental spring energy equation which is given by E is equal to half kth square. The work done by the external force is given by this equation and then finally using all the above uh, relationships we can find the total energy of the in the bond and is given by this equation where F, U, F of U is the external force vector of the particles. And according to the energy minimization principle, we have this equation for which we need to find a solution. The Euler method is the simplest method of solving nonlinear problems. And um, we'll be talking about three methods here, Euler, Modified Euler, and Newton method. 
the first step in Euler method is to divide the load into n steps, like we can see here in the figure. Not every n step, but a couple of steps have been displayed. For each calculation step, the incremental displacement is calculated using the tangent stiffness matrix. And the Euler method is usually used to solve large deformations through a number of small deformation analysis. The main advantages of this method are its um, robustness and the simple implementation. However, it requires regular updating of the computational mesh and the corresponding stiffness matrix from the conventional small strain analysis. It is a less precise method compared to the others that may cause some errors in extremely large deformation analysis. Coming to the modified Euler method and the Newton method, the Newton method is definitely the most precise one, while the modified Euler method is the most robust. A combination of both the modified Euler and the Newton methods can result in better performance and is recommended. The steps followed in all the methods are similar, wherein we first find the initial equation, using which we go for n minus 1 steps and then find the uh, final equation. Okay, so after going over the governing equations and general principles, we're going to go into a hand calculation itself. Due to the complexity of the uh, this type of uh, method, it's important uh, to use uh, computational work in order to uh, develop uh, results uh, that would accurately represent what's happening. Um, but right now for calc hand calculations, we're going to do a simple version of what uh, is done um, for each individual particle when it's in the material. So we're going to assume uh, that we have a material of a length of a thickness of one meter. Uh, we are going to only be looking at uh, material particles between 0 0.01 meters. So it's a distance from A to B, as you can see here. And we're assuming they are connected through um, a an idea of the um, DSML, which is a spring in this case. So you can see here on the side, we also have the carbon steel. We have the Young's modulus Poisson's ratio um, for carbon steel. We also have the forces that are being applied to the material itself. So in order to calculate uh, the actual stress and strain on these uh, between A and B, we use uh, the idea of a sp uh, the spring constant for a thin body material for normal spring. We aren't doing shear spring in this case. So the equation you see above is the equation for a sp the spring constant for a thin body normal spring. Uh, then we, in order to uh, run through this calculation, we also need the spring constant parameters, as you can see here in the second set of equations. Uh, that is going to give us a solution of one using this value and the values either from the material property, which is like Young's modulus and Poisson ratio. We're able to calculate that the spring constant is 6.7 times 10 to the 11th power um, newtons over meters squared, um, as you can see here. So after collecting that date, that uh, calculation, we actually also have to calculate uh, net force, which is the force over the distance. The distance in this case is distance from A to B, so it's the 0 0.01 meters. Um, you're going to get a 20,000 uh, newtons per meter in this case. Uh, then finally, we have to calculate uh, the displacement that occurs, because that's the only way we're going to calculate stress and strain in this case. So um, we know the calculation for F net equals to um, spring constant times the distance, the displacement of distance. Um, so in this case, we move around the equation. So now we have the displacement over equal to um, force net over the spring constant. As you can see here, uh, the numbers are inputted and we get a value of 2.977 times 10 to the negative eight meters. So after getting the displacement, we run through the actual stress and strain calculations for this plate. So we know for strain, it's the displacement over the length um, in this case, length is the length of the material. So uh, we have 2.9 times 10 to the negative 8 meters over 1 meter, which is going to get us 2.977 times 10 to the negative 8 as our strain. And our stress is equal to our Young's modulus times strain, um, as you can see here. So uh, the Young's modulus is 210 times 
uh, 10 to the ninth um, newtons per meter squared uh, multiplied by our strain, which was 2.977 times 10 to the eighth, which gives us a final uh, value of 6,251.7 newtons over meter squared. So this is a simple example of what happens um, uh, for this type of method. It uses displacement in order to calculate stress and strain and uh, Poisson's ratio uh, remains constant throughout this whole thing. The calculation uh, for the material uh, for each individual particle is what we're looking at in this type of method. Again, due to the complexity and how it's broken down per material, uh, there's a lot of uh, individual particles inside of a material. So uh, the only way to accurately or efficiently calculate these types of, uh, using this type of method is using computational work. So this is where we're going for the numerical example. So this is an example of a, a numerical and computational model that was created. So you can see on the right, uh, there's a computational model. A numerical example of this type of method can be seen um, in one of the research papers conducted um, uh, talking about these DLCM for qua uh, quasi brittle uh, cracking propagation. This is for specifically for concrete. So you can see here, this is an example of the computation and numerical work that was done using uh, this type of uh, computational modeling and uh, the numerical results uh, implemented from this. You can see um, M is uh, the greater, uh, the greater the M, the greater the homogeneity of the computational model and the closer to the numerical response uh, corresponding to the homogeneous model. So you can see here how the uh, the more the larger the M, the higher the strains and forces um, that we can see here. Uh, this is similar to what's happening in the actual material itself, but the accuracy is still not to where we want it to be for a nonlinear uh, material. But you can see how uh, changing certain parameters in the computational model can actually result in values that are close to what uh, we want uh, in the real world, at least what we see in the real world. This is an example of uh, their methods, uh, their actual physical experiment and numerical modeling uh, using the research from pre the previous slide. You can see uh, their actual tests and then the actual results from this type of testing. Um, this is another view of the testing done. So how GCSL is DLCM is used is used uh, for again for the individual particles in the material itself. In this case, we have C6 and C, uh, C60, which is a concrete 60 and a concrete 100. Um, you can see forces being applied to it and the resulting uh, fractures and errors. This is the type of uh, computational modeling that's used for this method, uh, just because of the complexity and the amounts of work that goes into uh, creating these types of computational models and uh, the calculations involved into this. Um, The lattice break method was developed just 10 years ago, so it doesn't have a lot of uh, applications yet. A non-study state of the lattice break model was also developed, and uh, we can see it below. In the first case, uh, we can see an object hitting a bar. So this, the initial, in both the scenario, we can see the object hitting the bar. Here, we can see the object falling apart in the first picture, and is it's still intact in the second one. In the second one, the object falls, undergoes deformation, but does not break. So this means the the stiffness of the material in the second is higher than the first one. The first one shows how the object undergoes fracture once it's dropped onto a platform. And the second image shows what happens when an object is destroyed by inserting a plate into it. Unfortunately, the 3D simulation video for the figures in the previous slide and this one are removed from the website, so I couldn't upload them here, but I'm trying to give you a general idea of how it will happen. Some of the other applications include efficiently using them to simulate the fracture processes in different materials under various loading conditions, 
the applications of lattice models in other fields such as um, transport analysis and model analysis are also there. Uh, there are also microstructure effects of um, strain and um, stress and uh, lattice mo models are also used for the construction analysis for bridges, especially the suspension ones. They're also used in metal forming, tire analysis, um, medical device analysis, and also for predicting the deformations in all um, engineering fields.